Exactly. Today, my guest is Kathy Jentz. And if you don't know Kathy, you probably should. Um, <laughs> there's <laughs> Kathy. Hi, Kathy. Um, Kathy Jentz is an award-winning, um, She uh, she's an award-winning author, publisher, editor, uh, podcaster, um, what what else am I missing? Um, so you have a magazine, Washington Gardener Magazine, mm -hmm. a Garden DC podcast, Ground Cover Revolution book, also an urban garden, urban, yeah, urban gardening book. Mm -hmm. Is it called Urban Gardening? It's called The Urban Garden and okay. 100, 101 Ways to Grow Food and Beauty in the City. So it's got one of those long sub hit subtitles. Fantastic. That a lot of books, a lot of books have those today. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. And, um, and you are like, you're a big deal. Um, and you're in the, in, you're in Maryland. Mm -hmm. So, um, thank you so much for coming on. I remember we, we hooked up a few months ago. Oh my gosh. And I totally dropped the ball. Uh, so I apologize about that, but we're here today and that's what Yay. matters. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. And I was, it was a crazy busy summer too. So this is, this is good. And I was going to say that the garden is starting to wind down, but it never does here. <laughs> it's always, always more to do. This is the middle of harvest season and seed collecting time and everything else in the world. And then the like cleanup and planting the, do you do um, cover crops for like winter yes. crops? Yeah. So I'll do some cover crops and part of my, I have a community garden plot across the street it's just a small vegetable garden like a 10 by 20 and what i don't cover with cover crops i'll cover with a thick layer of straw and some things i leave over winter so there's a perennials like asparagus you know that's yep. i just chop that back um uh when it starts to die back and the strawberries of course and the blackberries and then other things i have like um kale and arugula that i'll winter over as long as possible um some winters it'll come straight through <laughs> like last winter uh i was still able to get radishes and carrots the next spring from what i did in october radishes and then, yep and it's, it's amazing so i had daikon radishes um, a cover crop actually of daikon radishes in one bed Ooh. and I was like pulling those out and I was like oh you could actually eat some of these and I, I was you know planting them as a cover crop but no they pull it was such a mild winter last year I'm told this year is going to be a bad um, what is it called El Nino oh okay. I think it's El Nino pattern so it's going to be a bad winter so we'll see we'll see what how long things last oh gosh yay <laughs> um that's amazing and i didn't know about arugula too arugula will overwinter at least for a while yeah i usually will throw a cover cloth over it and so i can normally get it through december um and then it depends on how bad january is like do we have a lot of ice hmm. do we have a lot of snow sitting on top or is it a pretty mild january by february everything is usually i call it wet spinach you know what I'm talking about? Like, oh, yeah. yeah, like everything just laying on the ground looking horrible. And then that's the point where you're like, OK, I don't need I don't even need to go over the plot. I can skip it for four to six weeks. I just know that, you know, right. we'll just restart everything in March. Yeah. You, you just rest now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Amazing. That's so cool. And my my kill comes back every year. Um, which is, mm -hmm. which is cool. And I don't do anything. It just, mm -hmm. it just does it. It's cool. I love it. Um, and it's beautiful. It, I love the, it's like two tone sort of mm. it's like yeah, purpley like with a, a greenish. A yeah. That's a nice one. I like the purpley kale with the kind of red veining. It's pretty. I'm not a big kale eater. I must say <laughs> I grow it. I grow it, but I give a lot away. Yeah. I did I did for a while. I ate a lot for a long time. Now I'm now I'm big into arugula and mm -hmm. um and the spinach greens, like the um the mustard yep. greens. Yep. Mm, spinach greens. and arugula so much better than kale. I don't know. Kale had a really good PR person for a while, but you know, we were all tricked. <laughs> <laughs> I'm boozled. Uh, yeah. Uh, 
<laughs> but um, so you were saying, Kathy, that uh, your specialty is urban gardening, which uh, is awesome. I love urban gardening. And because, of course, you live in you live in the city in Maryland. So I'm right on the Washington, D.C., Silver Spring, Maryland border. So I'm a block like as the crow flies a block from the city edge of Washington, D.C. And Silver Spring, Maryland is pretty um, older suburb like one of those train train suburbs and I'm between two metro stations, two subway stations and next to a community college. So um, basically high rise apartments on one side of me, Victorian homes from the 1880s to 1920s on the other side of me. <laughs> so I'm, like, awesome. I'm the little tiny neighborhood in between those two big differences. Um, but it's always fun. You're right on the line. Um, you're walking the line. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that's very Well, I mean, best of both worlds, right? Um, mm -hmm. Modern and old. Uh, yeah. And so wh why, why is urban gardening such a, such a passion project for you? Yeah, I think um, I remember going to, I don't know if you've ever been to a simplicity circle type meeting back maybe like 10 or 15 years ago. And there was a documentary shown on how Cuba survived the oil crisis. Like they basically had nothing. <laughs> and how, how they were able to feed themselves in the city and grow. Um, and I realized, oh, that's what I've been like working at this whole time. And I just didn't have words to describe it until watching this documentary of this really intensive urban food farming in the city and how people cooperated with each other because they had to, they, it was like, it wasn't, you know, romanticized is because they had to eat and this is what they had available. And cause every time I would walk by, you know, a construction lot that just sat for three years and there would be a one tomato plant coming out of it, I'd be like, oh, do you know what could be done with this space and how much can grow there? And so I was always one of those people pushing um, other people to grow something mm -hmm. and like have anything but turf grass lawn. I was like, well, you could have a turf grass lawn or you could have a bunch of blueberry bushes right here. And if you don't eat them, the wildlife will. Um, so that's always been like a little bit of a passion for me. And so as a little kid, my parents had a community garden and I did not love it. I must say it was work <laughs> because we had to weed and haul water to it. Uh, yep. um, and hauling water, as many gardeners know and others know, that's one of the worst chores, especially in the middle of summer when the watering is needed to be done the most. But I would go visit my grandparents in Germany, in Bavaria, and they had a 99-year allotment. So same thing as our community gardens, but usually a little bit bigger, mm -hmm. uh, big enough that you could have a little shed and a barbecue and a house on it, whereas most community gardens here, you could barely like fit in your plot. <laughs> so right, right. They actually, they actually had room for fruit trees and trees, and they had a 99-year lease, so you were gardening like you had a 99 year lease with you know with fruit trees and and a cistern and everything and i just love playing in that garden so that's probably where that got sparked um on that side and that was very much city living where you were in an apartment during the week and you spent almost all your weekend at your right. allotment yeah. garden mm -hmm. that's great oh gosh that's such a cool i just love that um I love that sort of mindset. Like you can work, 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 and then you're getting away from it and just focusing on growing things and focusing on, I don't know, just being away and doing something completely different. Uh, and yeah, I just, I love that whole idea. I mean, my garden is right next door, but Mm -hmm. um, I like the idea of getting a way to do that and just being there to focus on it and not having the distractions of life. Mm -hmm. But yep. um, yeah, that's such I, a 99 year lease, 99 mm -hmm. year community. What is, what did you call that? So they're called allotment gardens. They have them in, in Britain and France and Germany, different, different countries will have them in Europe, but they, it's you're renting it but it's a lease is like so cheap like a dollar a year or something like that and you're signing for 99 years with the ex expectation that 
you're going to be in it for a long time. It's not like America where we, you know, you move have to renew it. Every, yeah. <laughs> or you have to renew it yeah. every year and or that you oh. own it. Like right. there's the two there's the two systems here. You either own it or yeah, we're I'm renewing my community garden um through our county park system. Hmm. So every winter we have to say whether we want to re up on it and then pay our fee for the next year. And then otherwise it goes back into the pool of available lots for anybody. Got it. Okay. That's really cool. I, and so you, in your, your grandparents could put, you were saying they could put like fruit trees and stuff and grow mm -hmm. things that will take a long time to grow. That's great. Yeah. I remember they had gooseberries and other, you know, strawberry patch and things like that. And a very old herb garden. So I'm going to introduce you to somebody. He's he was crawling under me. This is Kimba. Hey, Kimba. <laughs> he's oh, just one he's enormous. Old. Yeah, he's a big boy. He got to be a very big boy. He, one year ago, he was this little kitten like this size in the palm of my hand. And now he's like this big bruiser. <laughs> so. That's a big neck. Yep. <laughs> he's like. Oh, no. This is my weightlifting. Dude. <laughs> Kimba, you're a but big dude. He has a big brother. Um, I don't think he'll come along here. Santino is a Maine Coon. Um, not related, just adopted brother. But yeah, for a tabby cat, a mixed Siamese tabby, he is much bigger than he should be. <laughs> I always gorgeous. said as a kitten, he must have done weightlifting because all of a sudden he got this muscled neck and muscled body. And I'm like, are you down here in the kitchen pushing weights all night? Like, what is going on? <laughs> oh, my gosh. Could not, could not figure it out. And his sister was so tiny in comparison to him. So we'll see if his sister comes along. They're so funny. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> um, I know my sister, my sister lives in Cincinnati, and they live across from a, a, a community gardens. And somebody... Um, I know somebody we we visited there and somebody has um, they had okra growing and I've never seen okra growing before and it was this tall tall mm -hmm. um, plant and it was so cool looking uh, and it was and I didn't know I mean I didn't know what it was I was like what the heck is that but it grows really fast mm -hmm. um, but I just love the idea of community gardens too I mean they're yeah. really there's so much space that could be used as community gardens yeah, and one of our community gardens in the county was, most of it is county parkland that's been carved, you know, a little here, a little there. One of it was a developer who was just sitting on land. He owned a 7-Eleven next door to it. And he was like, for the next five years, you guys can use it. And that's ideal situation, like where you can have something that's just, it's going to be something else. It's sitting unused. Why not take advantage of it? Um, so that's ideal too. And I love that you brought up okra because that's one of my favorite things to grow. And I'm always pushing. I feel like I'm the okra pusher because I'm always like, it's so easy to grow. You just put a seed in the ground and it basically takes care of itself. And people are like, okra, blah. But I'm like, you haven't tasted fresh, fresh okra straight from the plant. It's that's the true. whole different thing. <laughs> yeah. And it's just, as you said, it's a beautiful plant. Like even if you didn't even harvest anything, it's it's a hibiscus. It's just a gorgeous flower. It's I've never seen anything so cool. Mm -hmm. And it's so prolific. All you need are a few. And it's just like, it, well, it's so prolific that if you don't go out and pick it every day, uh, then it starts to get woody and yucky. So it, it makes you go out to the garden frequently. Mm hmm Wow. Um, and so urban gardens, you're, what got you, what got you started doing this, Kathy? You've been doing this for a little bit. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I started, I started the magazine. Our first issue was, issue was March, 2005. And just so that everybody, all your listeners or watchers know, uh, it's Washington DC, not Washington state. Because a lot of times they'll hear Washington Gardener and they'll just assume it's the left coast, but it's the right coast. Um, so I started it because I was doing association communications work. I was working at different trade and professional associations. And I was director of communications at one. And I was looking around for another job. And I was like, I really need to just work for myself. 
Like <laughs> I didn't want to make a lateral move. I didn't want to go into association management, but I was doing magazines and newsletters and websites and other communication tools for them. And I was also at the same time had bought a small condo and I was gardening like a crazy person and I was getting my hand slapped by the condo board, the HOA, because I was gardening into the common areas and that was not my place to be gardening. <laughs> I was just like a little bit here, a little bit there. So I decided to buy this small house here and small house on a large pie shaped lot um, just to have gardening space. And that's when I was like desperately looking around for gardening information for our local region. And I wasn't finding much like in the major national magazines, there's a lot about new England or California or the Chicago area. But I was like, we have a huge gardening region in the mid Atlantic, you know, all throughout Pennsylvania and New York state, New Jersey is known as the garden state. Right. Doesn't have, own, doesn't have its own gardening magazine at the time or anything. So that's when I decided to launch um, my own garden magazine. And then the other things just grew out of that. The starting seed swap day and hosting seed exchanges, speaking, doing the books and the podcast. That's all grown out of the magazine. Wow. So that was the first thing mm -hmm. was the magazine. Wow. Um, and so that in 2005. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we're <laughs> coming up. I guess it's 18 years and we're coming up. I have to decide. I'm going to make some decisions about the 20th anniversary. Like I have to make some like, do I want to, you know, the magazine has evolved. It was print and bi-monthly and now it's monthly and it's digital publication. Um, we're members of Green America. And so we're in the Green Business Network and we have a green pledge. Um so when it was in print, it was for certified paper and soy ink, mm -hmm. and it had a water use pledge on it and everything. I do kind of miss having the paper version, but my messy, messy office here, uh, I still have stacks of back issues. So <laughs> Your like, office doesn't miss it. Yeah, my office in life doesn't don't miss having all that inventory. Having yeah. it online digitally is great. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I know my email inbox is, is very, very full. Cause I have a hard time letting go of things, but mm -hmm. at the same time, it's a good thing. It's not like physical because oh. that would, oh, it would just be too much, <laughs> too yeah. overwhelming. Definitely but, overwhelming. Yeah. But so, um, all right. So magazine is gardening and it's not just flowers. It's gardening in general, right? Because mm -hmm. it's, um, I, I always wondered that about like New Jersey, the garden state. I've, mm -hmm. I've only been to New Jersey a couple of times and all I see is pavement. Is it true that there's a lot of gardening? <laughs> area? Yeah. I think everybody sees it from the Jersey Turnpike or I-95 and that's sad. And then I always hear this expression, um, people who take the train from DC, to New York or commute, you're just looking at, you know, ugly backyards or, you know, you're not looking at the good part of the state. You're <laughs> looking at poor people's places because they are the ones who are living right next to that. And, right. or, and On the train to. line. Sure. Yeah. Or forced to, but yeah. But yeah, once you get away from that, it is a gorgeous state. And so is most of the mid Atlantic and we got nice temperate, um, conditions and we don't have knock on wood regular earthquakes or, <laughs> or tornadoes or hurricane or yeah yep so we're in like a nice little sweet spot and the ice age came down but it didn't come down quite so far it kind of just touched the edge of us um so that makes it that's why we only have the low appalachian mountains we don't have those, that giant crack down the center like the grand canyon or the tall mountains on one side that would stop the rain from coming to the other side um, yeah a little um, less extreme than than a lot of the country yeah that's what helps make it more of a moderate climate here um and then i was going to say that with gardening you know everything can be recycled or be reused in some way so obviously you want to be as green as possible and compost and if you're a frugal gardener you can even do more like there's so many ways to save 
uh, money and your time and be like in a cooperative with other gardeners and sharing things. So I'm always exploring those avenues. Mm. Well, I mean, you do, you do seed saving and you do seed mm -hmm. swaps, right? Yep. So I started, cool. I started uh, hosting an annual seed exchange in winter every year. And then I started Se national seed swap day and I've dropped the national from it. Cause I realized that was very limiting. I was like, why did I call it national seed swap day? It's just seed swap day. So because uh, I started to get a lot of requests from seed swaps and, and exchanges in Canada and Mexico and the Caribbean and saying, can we join your listing? And I'm like, uh, yeah, why, why did I put the word national? That was dumb. So yeah. So anybody, anywhere, um, it's always the last Saturday of January, but I always say celebrate it whatever day you want to celebrate it on. That's just, we just pit, put a pin in the calendar and that was the day we picked for that. Yeah, that's great. I love that. Um, we need to have more of that stuff, like just community, community sharing. And I mean, there, there's so many, I know I'm, I'm a seed hoarder. I'm a seed mm -hmm. hoarder. I can't yeah, stop aren't, buying. Aren't we all? Yeah. <laughs> and then, and I know that I have too many and, and I, I give things away, but I, I'm scared to give too many things away. <laughs> Because I'm also a terrible gardener and things don't always come up. So I need to try two or three times sometimes. But, mm -hmm. um, but I love the idea. And I, I do try to save seeds. I save some seeds. Mm -hmm. um, but well, do you, it, how do you save? Do you save like lettuce seeds and stuff like that? I don't know yeah. how to do that. So that one's actually, oh, I was, I mentioned Santino before. Here he is. I knew he'd have to get in screen time too. <laughs> so this is the main coon, Santino. Um, so he definitely was like, no, Kimba can't have it all the attention. So um, yes, as far as lettuce seed, actually that's one of the best ones to save because lettuce seed have the lowest germination rate after their first year of storage. Like most seeds, I always tell people at the seed exchange, your seeds can be, seed pack can be five years old, seven years old, whatever. Still probably going to get a pretty good germination rate. Just plant extra. Like if you were going to plant three cucumber seeds on this mound, plant six or nine and you're bound to get three of them, right? But with lettuce, it Forget goes it. from from a 90% to a 10% in one year. It has to be fresh. So that's one that if you're growing lettuce in the spring um, into summer and then it starts to bolt and form flowers, let it go to seed and then just snip those seed heads off as they're starting to dry and just put them in a paper bag and hang them up like in a closet or your laundry room or wherever garage, whatever dry place you have, and then collect those seeds and then you can plant them that fall. when you. Do so just your... snip the flowers off the top and... And yeah, let them dry to form seed heads and starting to dry, that's when you're going to snip it off. Um, so you have to let it go to bolt um, and you have to leave that space for another like four to six weeks after you would have pulled out the lettuce at that point. But same thing with arugula, cilantro, all of those, you know, the flowers are edible. The seeds are edible for most of those plants. And you want to save some for yourself to use. And then you could... I mean, once you're saving lettuce seeds, you're going to get thousands. So plenty to share. And because it has such a quick um, germination rate drop off, you want to share them as soon as possible because they're just going to go to waste if you don't. Mm, that's good to know. Um, I That must be why my lettuce hasn't come back. Mm -hmm. Don't because use old lettuce <laughs> seeds. <laughs> yeah. That one, like most of the seed packets have an expiration date because of agricultural laws and the government and it'll just say packed for 2023 it doesn't say best if used by it doesn't say must use by it just says packed for that year um because they just want the consumer to have fresh seed that year mm -hmm. um and they're not they're kind of guaranteeing that they're not selling you old seed but that's that has nothing to do with the seeds longevity itself Lettuce is special. Okay. <laughs> I will remember that. Um, and I will be trying that soon. Mm -hmm. uh, that's really cool. I'm thrilled to know that. Uh, and I do save my cilantro. I save my cilantro and I save my 
arugula because it makes those like pods right arugula yep yeah makes the pods. And you get, so then you get also with the cilantro of course it's coriander so that a bonus right there edible and yummy <laughs> and a good spice to have on hand twofer yes uh that's oh man that's really cool and that explains a lot because my lettuce has not been coming up the last couple of years mm -hmm. uh excellent oh i learned something good that's great yeah. uh <laughs> but um so you Okay, but so the gardening thing, where did the gardening thing start for you, Kathy? Like, have you just always done that? Because you said in 2005, you were doing magazines mm -hmm. and you noticed that there was no gardening yeah. magazine well, that's for the I was, area. I was gardening here at my house and just taking away all the turf grass and making it all gardening beds. And I was just gardening like crazy you know once you catch the gardening bug and so that's when I was like we need a resource for this area and that's when I started to put two and two together and started the magazine but yeah it was like you know as a child playing in the garden kind of osmosis um but it wasn't until I had my own place the condo that I was really gardening up a storm and then needing my own space so I would say you know that's that's the trajectory of a lot of gardeners that you know until you get your own place or own plot of land or your own pots to plant in you're gonna be like oh gardening looks fun or it looks interesting but once you start then you get addicted yeah let's try this mm -hmm. so do you have any turf grass at your place I do not. It's all gone. <laughs> so I've replaced it with ground covers, which is my new book, Ground Cover Revolution, or with trees and shrubs. And um, that's why I have the community garden plot across the street, because after a certain number of years, they always say a, a garden is mature at 10 years. That's when your full sun just became full shade. So <laughs> to in order to grow vegetables and most herbs I have over there oh okay all right that's interesting um and uh yeah so we've been i've been working with i my husband is an arborist and so we've we're like always sort of um head to head like i just want i want to plant more i also have a jam business so i i want to plant more <laughs> fruit stuff and yeah. um so i'm like let's put some more blueberries in he's like well where we put them like let's put them in the middle of the yard he's like well that's gonna make mowing really hard i'm like what if you don't have to mow all the yard mm -hmm. what if there are blueberries there and you don't have to mow there at all <laughs> so i'm just like i'm working on that and we can put some raspberries or mm -hmm. you know. and i like i we have um we have some apple mint that i'm just like let's just scatter it you know if he does mow it it'll smell like mint and it'll be amazing and we have these huge mm -hmm. mint patches um i'm like just let it grow. <laughs> yep. Exactly. But, um, and I've had, I've had two people, at least two people come over this year. Like I, somebody's come over three times and I'm like, just take mint, please. Um, <laughs> like, yeah, people people you charge started. you for it, but I really, there's no way I could use it. No. And yeah, once you have mint, you have it. <laughs> so the more for everybody else to share. Yeah. It's cool. But um, yeah, I'm working toward that. And I, I mean, we have, we have a, we're on an acre, so we've got a lot of planting to do, but we're working on it. Mm -hmm. uh, but so tell, tell me about ground cover. Like what, mm -hmm. what's the, uh, what's the, what's the big deal about ground cover? So the main thing about uh, the new book, Ground Cover Revolution is um, reducing or replacing turf grass lawns. So in an effort to be more sustainable, lower maintenance, um, lighter on the earth, beneficial for our wildlife and birds, because most ground covers have some flowering, which turf grass will not, or if the flower, if it does flower, it's probably gotten too tall for you to even maintain in any way. So um, just reducing or converting some of your landscape to ground covers is going to save you a lot of time and money as well as being a more sustainable lifestyle. That sounds like a win, 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 win. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. And you, and it's prettier. 
how's that? <laughs> like, yeah. there's, there's a lot of great ground covers that are just much more gorgeous than a turf grass lawn could ever be. Yeah. So what's considered a ground cover, Kathy? So there's a huge wardrobe of ground covers. I narrowed it down in my book to my 40 top um which was it was really tar- hard to do that it's an internationally published book so i tried to pick ones that were available most everywhere um ones that were workhorses that do well for a, a mm. wide range of growing zones sure um, so that limited me a lot but so most people will think of the classic definition of ground cover which is something jet that is steppable and super low um, but I broaden that out to anything that just covers the surface thickly enough that it keeps down the weeds. So that's my definition of literally a ground cover is something that covers the surface enough that it can outcompete the weeds. And you're in a few years, once that ground cover is filled in, you're not having to weed and you're not having to mow. Maybe you're going to do a once a year cutback of this ground cover. Um, some of them you could do it just for cosmetic reasons because at the end of winter maybe it's looking a little rough or shaggy um, or brown tips but also mother nature will do some of that cut back for you so you might not even need to do that right uh so we have we have some like i don't know weedy thing that i was just noticing in the last few days that it did, like it looks almost like lace mm-hmm. and it's very very low and it's covering our walkway. And I don't know, I have no idea what it is, but I think it's a weed, but maybe it's a ground cover. Yeah. Um, but I, it works fine. <laughs> be both. Yeah, and the weed is just a plant that's out of place. So if it's doing its job, then it's not a weed. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but so I, I, I don't need you to, to list like the top 40, but um, could you name a couple just to give an, an example or two? Sure. One of my favorites are the epimediums. So that's also known as barren wart or fairy or bishop's hat. You'll also hear that. Um, So it's kind of got like a teardrop shaped leaf and it just Mm. crawls along the ground and makes thick patches. It's really good for dry shade, which I have a lot of under big oak trees here. And I'm not going to be out there irrigating or or watering my garden all the time. So that's good uh, for like eastern gardens or anywhere that's heavily wooded um that's a great ground cover choice Hmm. um if you're in a more sunny climate like in the desert southwest then sedums are a great choice so like the creeping sedum not the tall sedum like sedum autumn joy but the ground cover sedums and kind of related to that is like creeping rosemary and creeping thyme so those are two great herb plants that also make great understory plants in full sun because they love great drainage um have a great scent to them too when you do step on them and both flower prolifically for the pollinators and you can snip off a few pieces and use them in the kitchen too i mean just because they're a miniature version doesn't mean you can't eat it as well right i didn't realize there was a creeping rosemary that's cool Mm -hmm. we've got a huge patch of creeping thyme and it's beautiful yeah and sometimes you'll see it at a garden center or in a catalog. It'll say something like elfin uh, time or elfin version or fairy garden. Like they'll sell it under the fairy garden category or oh. miniature, even like for miniature railroads, like because oh, they're okay. looking for tiny leaf stuff that just crawls along the ground. So <laughs> sometimes you'll see it that way too. Okay, cool. Oh, well, that's a good one. I mean, that's because it's also, it makes rosemary flowers. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. For us, little, the full size rosemary, the the big rosemary shrub, um, we have a hardy version here in zone seven called ARP, not like AARP, not (laughs) the retired person, but take one of those A's off. So ARP, ARP uh, was bred uh, for the mid-Atlantic region. And that one does flower sporadically throughout the growing season and then when it goes into winter it has little tiny purple flowers but same thing with the creeping rosemary it'll also flower for you oh interesting um our sage uh, my sage was insane this year Mm -hmm. i've never seen anything like it we i had like six plants and it was like bushes literally 
Um, and it flowered and I've never seen sage flowers before. And they were mm -hmm. beautiful also with the flat, uh, purple. Oh yeah. <clears throat> but I've talked to a bunch of people who said that theirs also flowered and I don't know if there's something to like this year or if it's, I don't mm, know. You just might have a longer growing season this year. Like your frost might be delayed, but yeah. I don't know. We had a really late frost this spring, so I have no mm -hmm. idea. It was a weird year. But anyway, that's great. I mean, those that's really cool to know, um, to have a few examples. And I'm going to be looking into some creeping rosemary because I like the mm. smell. Mm -hmm. um, that's great. And so that, it seems like it will solve a lot of problems. Mm hmm yeah, it's a good one for like under roses or you were talking about growing raspberries. So under berry bushes, that would be a good um, partner for those situations. And then you wouldn't have to mulch and uh, it would serve the same thing as I call it a green living mulch. So it holds down the weeds, keeps the moisture in, insulates the root area. So all those same benefits, but without having to actually manually add um, wood chips or chopped up leaves or whatever you mulch with locally. Yeah. <clears throat> all the things again, win, win, win. Uh, yeah. But, and so, and things like rosemary, I, I would assume might keep pests away. Yeah. There is, is some beneficials, you know, it's going to attract um, pollinators to right. it. Um, so usually all types of bees are attracted to both the creeping rosemary and creeping thyme. Um, but you know, deer don't love it. That's one good benefit of those because of that herbal scent that it exudes. Deer are not going to usually come and step on it, but they'll, they might reach over for your berries still. <laughs> so I can't say that it will be a no guarantees. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If they're hungry enough, they're like, I can ignore the, the, what they think is a very strong scent. Yeah. Right. Oh, well, sure. I mean, we all do that, right? Yeah. <laughs> if you want it bad enough, you'll take the risk. Uh huh. Cool. Uh, let's see. What else am I missing? Um, but so that I'm really, I, I was telling Kathy before we started, uh, but before we started recording, I put that book in my, in my Amazon cart because mm -hmm. that is very interesting. And I love, I'm like, I'm working toward, um, I'm working toward, uh, getting rid of turf grass and, uh, having more, more plants. So, uh, and that's just, it's just a cool thing to not have to worry about watering and have to worry about, you know, and then to add more flowers for the, the, um, the beneficial insects and birds and stuff like that. Like, it just seems like everyone's going to be happy if we do that. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> I think that's a great plan. Yep. And I'm working with, um, American Meadows. They're a seed and plant company, um, to start annual reduce your lawn day so the first one will be next may 20th 2024 will be the first ever reduce your lawn day um, so we're hoping that people everywhere will just evaluate take a few minutes that day to think you know what could be here instead of this section of lawn or do i really need this part uh, that i haven't walked on in years except for to mow it <laughs> so nice in that way just thinking about how to reduce that impact Nice. That's awesome. You said it's called American Meadows? Yeah. So Reduce Your Lawn Day will be posted. I think the website's done. It'll be posted in the next week or so. Um, and then you could just Google Reduce Your Lawn Day or go to reduceyourlawnday.com or .org. And then uh, it's being hosted on the American Meadows website. Awesome. <clears throat> All right. Cool. So, um, uh, let's see. When I say the word sustainability, Kathy, what does that mean to you? Hmm. I would say it means a green lifestyle that you can live with, you know, comfortably and still have an abundance to share with others. Um, because it wouldn't be sustainable if you felt like 
ooh, I'm always having to hoard or keep this to myself. Um, so I would say it means abundance. That's my, that would be my biggest takeaway for sustainability and that I have enough that I can share um, and share with me in the future, but also share with others as well. Ooh, I love that. Um, and I, I was just thinking, I forgot to ask about the podcast. Mm -hmm. So tell us about the podcast. Yeah. So it started out of the, it was a COVID pandemic baby, like that, like so many other projects that people have started. So some people wrote books and some people baked bread or learned how to bake bread. And then I had this podcast on the shelf for a while. And I said, this is my opportunity to start the podcast um, with some extra time. So it's weekly. It's an interview format. It's called Garden DC and it's free wherever you listen to podcasts and on YouTube as well. And I just interview an expert on one aspect of gardening or one plant family every week. So it could be all about growing figs is one recent episode. So everything you need to know to grow figs successfully and, um, points and tips and the best varieties. And then another week, it might be about an aspect of gardening, like weeding or mulching or composting. Um, so I just pick the uh, experts brains and I've gotten some great guests. I've had Doug Tallamy talk about his book, um, Nature's Best Hope. I've had Margaret Roach, A Way to Garden. And we talked about weather and gardening because mm. when you get gardeners together or anybody really, the weather is a hot topic. For <laughs> so, sure. And how it goes into climate change as well. For sure. Oh my gosh. Absolutely. Uh, and did you say that that's weekly? Yes. Yeah, so it comes out every Dang. Saturday. Yep. <laughs> I do take a break over uh, the holidays, the winter holidays. Um, so that's what I'm evaluating right now is like, where's my stopping point for 2023 and then restart in early January. Right. Yeah. Oh my goodness. What are you going to do when you have time off? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because right now you've got the magazine going and you've got several gardening clubs and so Kathy mm -hmm. was saying that the podcast mm -hmm. started because she had had it, she was thinking about it. You had had it like in your head for a couple of years, but you were supposed to speak at the, was it the Philadelphia? Yeah, I was coming back from the Philadelphia Flower Show and I had a bunch of other speaking gigs lined up and other events and they all got canceled, you know, the second of the pandemic shutdown where they told us it was two weeks, right? And then it became three weeks, four weeks. And every time it got extended, more stuff got canceled or rebooked. Um, so that gave me that time at the, in that period to launch the podcast. And that's when I figured out, oh, it only takes a couple hours a week to do a podcast episode. It's not, you know, you could spend your entire week working on one hour, but you don't have to. Right. Oh my gosh. That's amazing. Um, so podcast, magazine, books, garden clubs, mm -hmm. your editing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm working on, so I do some freelance writing and editing for other uh, plant groups as well. But yeah, they always say no rest for the wicked, right? So <laughs> no no rest. I mean, mm -hmm. they, and they also say when you, when you start to slow down, you really slow down. Right. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's a gift. Yep. Um, uh, but, um, okay. Is there anything else that I forgot or neglected to ask that you would like to get across? Um, I was trying to think of, well, if somebody is interested in, being a garden writer or garden communicator that there's a great association called garden com and it's garden C O M M. Um, so that's for anybody who's like an influencer, blogger, YouTuber, their hmm. garden book writer, maybe they have a radio show or their podcast. Um, so it's a group of us garden communicators and we're just turning 75 years old this year. So, Wow. and going strong so that's a great group to join 
And I would say also podcasting in general, whether it's a garden podcast or green podcast or anything um, that if you're thinking of doing a podcast, I encourage you to do it because there's, you know, tons of podcasts out there, but there's not your voice, right? You're the only you. Um, So there's a space for everybody. True story. And the people you will meet, you can't even imagine. (laughs) That's a true story, 100%. Well, um, so Kathy, if somebody is like needing to follow you and find your books and find your magazine and find your podcast and find your blog and find, <laughs> you know, follow you and learn all about you, what is the best way to find you? So on most platforms for social media, I'm at WDC Gardener. Um, so that's like Twitter slash X, Instagram, Pinterest, TikTok. Although TikTok's kind of fallen to the wayside with me. I'll reach over. My publisher would probably love it if I would hold up some books. So that's the cover of Ground Cover Revolution. That's hard to see with the pew, pew, pew. But the, the filter. <laughs> the filter that makes it hard to see with the blur. But um, so they can just uh, go to Amazon like you did and Kathy with a K, J-E-N-T-Z, that will come up. I also encourage people to buy the book off of bookshop.org to buy either book because then they're supporting their local um, independent bookstores or they can put it to their local library sometimes, depending on your local library. And I have another kitty messing with me back here. Um, So they can also follow me at um, washingtongardener.blogspot.com is the blog on YouTube. It's just Washington Gardener magazine, same on Facebook and the podcast is garden DC, all one word. And I came up with that title for the podcast because that's the hashtag I've been using for years is hashtag garden DC. So that's another way to just Google that hashtag or find that. And you can pretty much find me anywhere. Because you do it all. (laughs) Goodness gracious. Well, Kathy, oh my gosh, thank you so much. I can't even, I'm so grateful to have spent this hour with you. Um, You're a wealth of knowledge. And I'm just, I just feel so lucky to have gotten to hang out with you. Well, Um, it was nice talking to you. It It was fun. And I was like, oh, I can relax and take a little trip down memory lane. So that's always good. And it makes you, when people are asking you questions, because I'm usually the interviewer, um, being the interviewee makes you like actually sit down and, and pause and think about things. Yeah. Well, it kind of takes the heat off a little bit, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. It's a little bit easier to be on that side. Well. Sometimes. I mean, it depends sometimes. on the questions, right? Exactly. I was going to say, it depends. Sometimes. I feel like when I'm talking to some of my interviewees, they're ner- they're very nervous about talking, but they're just, you know, they would want to get it right. Yeah. yeah, true. Yeah. Well, um, I've really enjoyed this and I <laughs> can't wait to share this message. So I really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Let's see. Stop recording.